So this presentation is called Bite Size Contribution, and it's about, you know, my goal with this presentation is for people who uh, are not actively involved in the Drupal community, I would like to encourage you to get, to become involved, and for people who are already somewhat involved, I'm hoping I can convince you to become more involved. So I'd, I'll tell you a little bit about me in just a second, but I would love to learn more about who's in the audience today. So Susan had mentioned age of Drupal.org accounts. How many people's Drupal.org account is uh, a month or newer? You, you, you registered on Drupal.org a month ago. How many people do not have a Drupal.org account? Okay, so after this presentation, what are you gonna do? Yeah, you're gonna go to Drupal.org and register for an account. And how many people have an account that's, let's say, six months or older? Okay, great, and uh, a year or older? Okay, two years? Four years. All right, so a great, a good mix of people. And how many people um, have, have an account but have never posted on Drupal.org? Okay, yep. And so in terms of um, the roles that you all fulfill in terms of your job or your interaction with the community, and you can raise your hand for more than one. Raise your hand if you're a designer, you consider yourself a designer. And maybe a business owner. Yep, so a good number of business owners in the audience. And maybe a back-end developer, okay, and a front-end developer. And leave your hand up if you don't know the difference between your front-end and your back-end. <laughs> okay. Great. So I work for a company called Acquia, um, and I don't know if you've heard, but we're hiring. Uh, we were recently declared the fastest-growing private software company in the United States uh, by Inc. Magazine, the business magazine. And what's exciting about that is not so much that we are growing for our own sake, but that a business built on Drupal and on spreading the use of Drupal in the enterprise is a viable business and is actually you know, growing very quickly. Uh, we've got huge learning and growth opportunities. We added something like 120 people or so in the last year, tons of smart Drupal folks, a great vacation policy. So if you're interested in working with Acquia, either in a technical role or a marketing role, we've got a range of different positions open. Come talk to me, I'd love to tell you more about Acquia, answer your questions. You can also stop by our booth and talk to the fabulous folks out there. So just real briefly about me, um, in the Drupal community, I'm the project maintainer for the Drupal Commons distribution, and specifically the new upcoming 3.x version uh, built on Drupal 7 which we've completely overhauled, redesigned from the ground up, and, and we're very excited about. Uh, and then historically also uh, the conference organizing distribution, which is now being led by Jacob Perry over there. Hooray, Jacob, uh, who just rolled a, an Alpha 2 of COD for Drupal 7 last night. Uh, in New York City, where I'm based, I'm one of the disorganizers of the 2,000 plus person Drupal group, and I help maintain the groups.drupal.org site. Speaking of which, this is a screenshot of just one part of the new Drupal Commons uh, distribution. And this is what, you know, we're, our goal here is to move groups.drupal.org over uh, so that it will look something like this, which is really the first overhaul and major investment in that site in probably in years. Uh, how many people know what a distribution is? I feel like they understand. Okay, so most people do make maybe half the room. Basically, when you install Drupal, you get the ability to build a website, right? You can point and click and write some code or maybe configure, and depending on the complexity of your site, in a day, in a week, in a month, you've got a web application or a website. With a distribution, when you install it, it's ready to do something out of the box. So it's a purpose-built web application that is, uh, it has the benefits of being built on Drupal, but is ready to go you know, for building your conference site or your collaborative community out of the box. So the frame for this presentation, um, you know, Greg, uh, yesterday's uh, presenter, talked about GVS, the company that we both worked at. Um, and there was this slide in Greg's presentation which talked about the overlap between contributed work and client work. And I think that a lot of folks who work in Drupal or maybe even have had businesses in Drupal for a long time often, often raise reasons why they don't feel that they can participate in the community. And so, you know, perhaps they look at this, this idea that Greg proposed that was really the, one of the main ideas uh, behind GVS and the way we ran the business. And they say, well, that's great, but I, you know, I can't really work out that overlap. For whatever reason, there are reasons why I can't do that uh, contribution time that brings everything together. And so the main goal of this talk is to sort of encourage you that, you know, in fact, you can, and to sort of break down the barriers that you might you might feel are there preventing you from participating. So I want to start with a few slides that I borrowed from Angie Byron or WebCheck um, because they're really the best slides on this topic that, that I've seen. 
and so she was gracious enough to lend me those slides. So this is Albert Einstein, and how many people think you've got to be this smart to contribute to open source, right? Like you've got to just be a total genius. It's okay if you don't want to raise your hand. That's not actually true, right? You don't have to be a genius to contribute. So what actually, what is a contributor, right? A contributor is very simple. It's a person who has three qualities that overlap. So we'll do another Venn diagram here. Somebody who sees something and says, that's dumb. I want to see it fixed and I can do something about it. And often I think people are maybe in the first two categories on top, but they don't feel that they're qualified to be in this category on the bottom. And I think that everybody in this room is qualified. And in fact, these are the people that power open source. So going to this idea of how improvements are made, here's, here's you know, a, a more, slightly more detailed picture of the way that some people feel that improvements happen in open source and, and specifically in Drupal. You've got somebody super smart, let's say she's Gina the genius, and because she's a genius, she has an enormous head. I don't know where she buys hats, you'll, you'll have to ask Gina. Uh, but she has this idea, and it's brilliant, right? She's got this, this huge, great idea, and she, she's like, oh, I'm gonna put it online, and shazam, there's this beautiful code, and it's perfect, and everyone's like, wow, Gina, that's amazing. You know, that's your best work yet. Come to my birthday party. Why won't you return my calls? Gina, please, call me back. I mean, we all have different relationships with Gina, I think. Um, but, but, but this is actually not what happened. So, you know, that no one is, I, I don't actually know any, well, I know one Gina, but that she's not, this is hypothetical. Gina's not a real person. Digging, digging up here. Um, so that's not what happens. Let's talk about what actually happens. So we've got Edwina, the end user, right? And she sees a problem that's a, that she thinks is a bug. Right? So she goes to Drupal.org and she goes to the issue queue. How many people have used the issue queue before? Right? This is where, this is where Drupal happens. It happens primarily in the issue queue. And Gina files a bug report and says, I think this is broken. And Paula, the programmer, maybe she maintains the project that Gina filed the bug report towards. Paula, the programmer, comes along and says, indeed, that is a bug. I'm going to try to fix that bug. So she goes and she files a patch, which is a file that changes the module that, in a uniform way so that other people can download the patch and apply it and, and test that change out. So she tests out the change, and then Tatiana, the tester, comes along. She's got these thick glasses that are you know, indicative of her wise skill and experience. Anyway, and she says, WTF, and I'm going to post some feedback. Right? So it's not perfect. She marks it needs work, and she says, you know, that's not ready. And so Paul is like, OK, take two. Let's try it again. New patch, files a new patch, marks it as needs review, and then Wendy, the poor soul stuck on Windows XP, right? She says it breaks in IE6. And, and you know, maybe that's a little out of date. I don't know anyone who's still supporting IE6. Maybe it breaks in IE8 or some version of IE that they just, you know, that just can't, can't quite get it together. And also there's a spelling error. We had one in comments recently, contributors, instead of contributors, which uh, people filed the patch for. And she marks it as needs work. And so Paula, and it could be Paula, it could be somebody else, re-rolls the patch and marks it as needs review. And this time everyone's like, wow, that's much better. You know, that's great. And it gets marked as reviewed and tested by the community, and it gets committed, and the change is approved, and that's how things happen. It's this really incremental process. And you know, in this diagram, to keep the diagram simple, we only had one Paula, the programmer. But in reality, what often happens is multiple people will work on the same patch. And so you know, one person gets it 10% of the way there, and the other person gets it another 20%, and that, work, that patch moves along incrementally until that fix is ready. So we need more people to participate in this way. So here are some sample statistics from the Drupal project. Uh, you can see here, let's say people who create an account on Drupal.org, 99.63% you know, of them download Drupal. That's great. 0.32% of those people actually register for an account, right? So most of the people don't even register for an account. And then of those people who did register for an account, or rather who did download the software, 0.05% actually do something with their account. So think about that, right? The idea behind open source software, and, and you know, such as Drupal, is that if everybody, every person and organization that used the software contributed enhancements back to the software, then everybody would benefit, right? Awesome. In reality, not everybody does, but a, a small enough percentage of people who use the software do contribute back. 
that it moves things forward and the software is competitive against proprietary vendor software and is, is really great software. So imagine if we had more people actually contributing stuff back, right? More than the 0.05% of people who download Drupal. So let's talk about some objections that you might have to why you can't participate in the community. Uh, a really common objection that people sometimes raise is, well, I'm not a developer, right? I'm not a software engineer. I can't participate. And this is the first one I like to knock down because there are so many ways to participate. There's a Drupal.org documentation team. There's a usability team. And those are both teams that work on things that, are not necess that don't necessarily involve writing code, but are, the improvements they make are very visible, right? If you en enhance the usability of the Drupal installer, everyone is going to see that. And you don't necessarily have to write the code that enhances the usability. You can conduct the usability test uh, that, you know, that discovers an issue. Like when we kick people in the face when they try to install Drupal, they're less likely to have a successful installation. So maybe we shouldn't do that. Um, does anybody know who the head of the Drupal.org documentation team is? Anybody know? The position is vacant right now, right? Because they're, you know, the head of the previous head of the team wasn't able to keep up with uh, you know, the commitment of doing that. And so now there's this opening. Anyone can join the documentation team. But the team is even looking for a team lead, right? So that's a very non-technical way. If you're good at writing, if you're good at uh, language, that's a great way to participate in Drupal. Functional testing is another way you can participate. Just if you learn how to apply a patch or down, you know, check out code from Git, you can test out something that somebody thinks is working and validate whether their patch is actually helpful or not. You know, you, if you can tell that something is broken, you're already ready to help. There's even a marketing uh, team for Drupal. So if you're thinking, well, I'm in marketing, I can't really participate, yes, you can. Uh, if you are multilingual, you speak more than one language, you can contribute translations to Drupal. So you get a list of strings like welcome to your site or save, and you just provide the version of those strings in a different language. And then people can download Drupal and have it work in Spanish or French or some other language. Uh, there's also lots of ways to provide support. So how many people have installed Drupal before? Right? Most of the audience. There's over 6,000 people in the Drupal.org forums who can install Drupal, right? They're like, I couldn't figure it out. You can go help those people. In fact, if you go to Drupal.org contribute, which is the ways to get involved in Drupal page, the number of ways to contribute in Drupal is so large, I can't even fit it in one screenshot, right? You've got to go to the page. So if your objection is, I'm not a developer, my response is, great. We need more people who are not developers. We need more of everybody, but we certainly need more people who are, who are non-developers. Check. So the next, next objection is, I'm afraid of looking new. And that's, this is an understandable one, right? There's people who've been around in the Drupal community for a very long time. They do this as their full-time job, and you're interested in getting involved, but you just, you know, you don't want to, you know, you're afraid of looking new. It's, it's understandable. It's a natural concern to have. So uh, anybody recognize the folks in this slide? So who do we have on the lower left there swimming? Michael Phelps, right? The most decorated Olympian in all time. And on the right, Yo-Yo Ma, the world-class cello player. How about on the upper left? It's uh, Sunita Williams, uh, com the former commander of the International Space Station, and Joan Higginbottom, uh, another astronaut and engineer. And what do they all have in common? Excellence, okay, what else? They all did the thing that they're great at for the first time at some point, right? So Yo-Yo Ma touched a cello for the first time. He didn't touch the cello and bust out some amazing Bach piece. It probably, he probably couldn't even make a sound on the cello. You know, Michael Phelps stepped in a pool for the first time, and the astronauts did whatever astronauts do when they do that for the first time. I don't know, I can't say because I'm not an astronaut. Maybe they astronauted. Um, I remember the first time I astronauted and it took a while to, to get things back together and clean everything up. I don't, I guess what astronauting for me means is like you eat a dehydrated ice cream sandwich or something. That's, that's about as close as I, well, I've, I've actually, well, does, the point is everybody's done something for the first time, right? Every master was once a newbie. And in the Drupal project, we've got people from all over the world with different backgrounds coming from different cultures. Some people have experience in software development, some people don't, some people are, you know, if you look at the map of where people are on Drupal.org that are participating, it's all over the world. So all these different cultures are represented. 
when you're working with somebody in issue queue or chatting with them on IRC, you know, just keep in mind they might come from a different background than you do. So we really need to foster a culture that's welcoming to new contributors. And just a little uh, side story related to that. So, you know, Susan mentioned that I, I, I had requested or suggested that maybe it'd be fun to have a swing dance lesson. Um, that comes sort of from Trooper Camp Asheville, where there was a sort of a spontaneous group of folks went out to try to swing dance. There was an event where there was supposed to be, it said live dancing and music, and we went and there was no dancing, there was music. And so we decided to provide the dancing, um, and it was a lot of fun. In any case, so uh, over the summer, I started taking swing dance classes, and because that was something that I wanted to learn and I thought it'd be fun. And dancing is this thing where you go out dancing and you can't pretend to be a good dancer, right? You can't fake it. Because if you could fake it, then you might be a good dancer, um, perhaps. And so I went to this social dance event and it was one of the first ones that I'd ever been to. And people are really good. Like you go to these things and you see, I saw dance happening in a social setting that I thought could only, you know, that I, I didn't realize that that level of dance happens when it's not a performance. That's just how good people are. And I was totally blown away. And on one hand, I was encouraged. I was like, yeah, I'm going to learn to do that. On the other hand, I was like, I don't know how to do that. Um, but people were super encouraging to me, right? I, was, I had like, taken a dance, a dance class. There were all these expert dancers. And people were like, hey, let me show you this. It's so great that you're here. And that was a really great experience for me because it, it reminded me, you know, I've been doing Drupal for a while. And so I think it's easy to lose perspective on what it feels like to be new somewhere and particularly to be new somewhere where it's very clear that you're new. And I think back on that experience over the summer, and I bet that if people were not welcoming to me, that I would have just not come back, right? If, if, if people were like, oh, new dance guy, get out of here, I would not have probably stuck with it. And instead, I, I am sticking with it, and eventually I will be able to, to dance well. So you should come dancing tonight. Um, there's a quote from, uh, from Greg, yesterday's speaker, that I, that I really like and, and want to share with you, which is that every complainer is a volunteer who's in need of a little direction. And the background on this is that sometimes somebody will make a nasty tweet or they'll file a bug report and they'll be really cranky and they'll say, oh, I can't believe this bug exists. How could this bug exist? Like, this is the stupidest thing in history. Oh, Drupal sucks. You know, something really snarky. Um, and, you know, you've been on the internet, you know how people can be. Uh, and, and often, if you point that person in a direction that shows them how they can help with the problem they're having, whether it's filing a bug report so the maintainer can fix it, or providing more specific information about the problem, or adjusting the documentation to be more clear, oftentimes that person who is really snarky and upset will feel really empowered to go ahead and, and take that action, and their attitude just completely turns around. And that's something that's, that's a really special for us. I mean, how often, in, you know, not just in software, like if you've ever had a bug with Adobe or Microsoft software or another proprietary vendor, you know that often you're just like at their mercy for when they decide to fix it. But I think there's a lot of situations where something is wrong in the world and we just feel powerless to change it. And what's cool about open source software is that whether it's a community policy or a bit of code, we're all empowered to, to make the change we want to see in the world. And so that's something that really gets people excited. So how many people know about the Google Summer of Code? <clears throat> Excuse me. The Google Summer of Code is a program where Google funds students to work on open source software and they assign mentors. I was a student once in the, in the Google Summer of Code. I've been a mentor, and I know lots of folks here have as well. It's a great program because it gets new people involved or more involved in various types of open source software. Um, and it's also a source of great contributors to, to Drupal. You know, these people come in as students, and they end up really uh, contributing later after they get more experience. So this is a quote from one Google Summer of Code student who says that, talking about her, you know, the, the student's project, it's, a, it's an update, it's a status update on the project. I would say the project is not quite as far along as I'd hoped it would be, but I feel I have a good grasp on what's left to be done. And I'm pretty confident that most of my major learning hurdles, which caused me to initially start slowly, will no longer be an issue during the second half of the program, right? I'm learning kind of slowly. Uh, you know, some things slowed me down, but I'm really confident that I'm going to overcome that. I've got a great attitude. So does anybody want to take a guess at who this is? What? It's not, it's not my <laughs> Does anybody know who it is? So this is Angie Byron, Webchick, right? And here she is a few years, short years later on the cover of Linux magazine. 
And it's safe to say that Angie is one of the most prolific contributors to the Drupal project. Really just a, a, an amazing human being. Um, but she's done, you know, she's been a, she's a Drupal core maintainer. She wrote the Using Drupal book. She led the migration of Drupal.org from CBS to Git. She was voted the best contributor at the Google O'Reilly Open Source Awards. She's the project lead for the Spark uh, Content Editor Experience Project. And the list goes on and on, and we don't have time to go through every fabulous thing she's ever done. But, you know, think back to just a few short years ago where she was a new, you know, new person in the community. She was honest. She said, you know, I'm learning, but I'm really motivated to, to make this work. People were supportive to her. And a couple years later, she's just an enormous monster rock star. So I thought it'd be fun to look at some other examples of contributors and when they were new for the first time. So here's a, here's a post uh, from February 2006. And the question is, it's in the Drupal.org forums. And the question is, what is a module and how do you make one, right? Pretty, for those of us who work with Drupal, we know that a module is a piece of software. It adds or extends functionality on a website. That's, you know, <clears throat> one of the first things, one of the first things you know. Same person, shortly, you know, like a month or so later, uh, I'm having trouble installing a module. And they're like, I might have already installed this module. I might have posted and forgotten. But can someone tell me how to install a module? Like, I don't even know if I've installed a module. I don't, I don't know what's happening. Where are we, right? This person is disoriented. Um, anybody know who this is? <laughs> it's, it's, it's not. Um, Sophocles, no. Uh, this is Dimitri, uh, Dimitri Gaskin, seen here playing uh, accordion. Uh, Dimitri Gaskin, Dimitri G01 on triple.org. So he wrote the Drush Make, Make project. He was a big contributor to vertical tabs in Drupal 7 core, which was a big usability improvement. He wrote the views bonus pack module and a ton of other contributors. Uh, and he also plays accordion, right? And just a few years ago, he also was new and asking fairly newbie questions. Another example, this is a personal uh, journal entry on Google Docs that I had to censor heavily because of all the, the words that were used that weren't appropriate. So it's like, blank hate you Drupal is the title and it's, the, the body is I blank hate you Drupal. This blank node blank is blanking blank. What the blanking blank is a blank node anyway, blank, 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 right? This person is, is not happy about Drupal. This is uh, Nikki Stevens, who was here yesterday. <laughs> Dr. Nikki, she gave a great presentation, right? She was the lead developer uh, for the DivX uh, Drupal website and is a, you know, a senior Drupal engineer doing a lot of interesting consulting work. Um, but when she got started, right, blankety blank 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 blankington from Blanksville, Arizona. Uh, so I thought it would be fun to encourage people to tweet their first uh, interaction on Drupal.org or one of their first interactions that showcases a time when they were new in sort of a lighthearted way. So if you, want to, if you want to do this, you can use the hashtag MyFirstDrupal. I tried to choose something that didn't sound too much like My Little Pony. I hope that that's uh, sufficiently different. Anyway, you go to drupal.org slash user, you go to your posts, you go down to the last page, and, and you'll find your post. So do you guys want to see what my first post was on drupal.org? So here we are, January 23rd, 2006. How do you let users have friends, in quotes? Was that a module? Great site. I'm in Portland or and New York and I often and plan on tracking down some site members, Ezra Gildas Game, Ezra Barnett Gildas Game. This is a ridiculous nonsense post, okay? <laughs> this post has no value. Um, I spelled module wrong, my punctuation is wrong, I have two signatures, like, Here's my name twice, in case you didn't read my name the first time. You know, like, I'm adding no value. But it's great that people didn't tell me to GTFO, you know, to just buzz off. Um, because a year later, right, so this is, the dates are kind of amazing how they line up here. January 23rd, 2006. Sorry, July 23rd, 2006. July 25th, 2007. So a year and two days later, here I am filing a patch for the five-star module. And I'm actually adding value now, right? This is a patch that fixes a bug. I described the bug. In five star field, ink on line 47, five star sets form PHP value to one. If the user viewing the form has the use PHP for five star permission or five star field on case update, when the field is being submitted when field PHP is true, five star evaluates the empty target text area, setting the target to null. Then 
when, if is numeric item sales to target comes back as false, the target is set to the target of the node containing the five-star CCK widget. Instead, I think five-star should come to check if the point PHP is true and verify that there is, in fact, you know, it just, like, it's, it's a useful post, and the patch got committed is the point. Um, and that's just, I mean, you know, it's just a year in between being like, is that a module and actually finding a patch. And it's really good that people didn't kick me out because, you know, I, I eventually got around to contributing something of value. So I encourage everyone to keep in mind, you know, this idea because you know who was new once? Babies. And you know who used to be a baby? Everybody. Okay? So if you're afraid to look new, my response is don't be afraid because we've all been there. Alrighty, so another objection, and this is one of my favorite objections. It isn't polished enough. It's not ready. So, and this is understandable too, right? You don't want to totally, it, this is understandable. And the situation is people have a project that they're working on. Maybe it's a module or it's a distribution and they're gonna release it, but they're not gonna release it yet because it's not ready, right? And so they hold on to it and they shine it and they work on it in secret or they, or, you know, they tell people about it, but it's not ready to go. And they don't post it to Drupal.org. Meanwhile, somebody else with a similar goal inevitably comes along and posts something else that's very similar. And the whole time that that other thing is on Drupal.org, it's getting feedback and it's getting patches and it's getting eyes on the code while your super secret awesome idea is still being imperfect in private. Someone else's imperfect idea is being imperfect in public where it's getting the benefit of all that attention. Um, and maybe by the time you think it's really ready, it's irrelevant because that other project that got released sooner, even when it was in a kind of a rough state, is, uh, has, already been, has already been shared. So does anyone recognize this picture? This is the original logo for the conference organizing distribution, or COD, and this is the current logo for COD. So I wanna flip back and forth, and can you, you can just, sit, what are some things you notice that are different? Happy colors, right, in the new logo. What else? Happy fish, yep. The word COD, there's a, yeah, sometimes this is presented with a call to action because there's the, the website. Another subtle distinction is that this fish is alive and this fish is dead, right? The logo for this project was a deceased fish. So can you imagine, like, and we built a business on this, right? We were like, come use our software for your critically important conference. Tell us more about your software. If it were any animal, what would it be? It would be a fish, and not only any fish, it would be a dead fish. But that didn't matter, right? And the thing is, it's not that uncommon for, uh, for software projects to have cartoon animals as their logo, right? PHP is the elephant. MySQL has the dolphin. But at least in those projects, the animals are alive, right? <laughs> if they were dead, they would look like this. But despite that, right, even though we had a dead fish as our logo, this is uh, some early usage statistics of COD. You can see usage just took off because the product was good enough. It wasn't perfect, but it was good enough. You know, we just went to, Wiki I went to Wikipedia. I was like, COD, picture of a fish, done. Like, didn't even look at it, really. Um, and, you know, this COD went on to power most DrupalCon and campsites around the world plenty of non-Drupal conferences around the world, uh, even though it, it, it's the mascot is, was dead for a very long time, uh, and eventually we upgraded and got a living mascot, which I think, you know, it was a good move, but we didn't have to do it first. That's lipstick on a fish. Uh, so if your objection is that your project isn't polished enough, my response is fish carcass, and I feel like that's kind of case closed. Like, how do you, maybe, I'm sure there are some creative illustrators in the room, and I, you know, we probably shouldn't go into how you could be less polished than a dead fish, but, uh, we did have a dead fish as our, one of our flagship product logos. So moving on to another objection here, I don't have time to contribute. How many people don't have time to contribute? I think this is when it's hard to admit, but a lot of us say this. Um, and this makes sense, it's understandable, right? There's often a lot of urgency around client projects, we're always on deadlines, we gotta get things shipped, we gotta get them out. Um, but I think that when people hear the word contribute, it's almost like contribute is a bit of a misnomer because contribution sounds like charity. We're giving away to charity, we're making a donation, and who in their right mind when they're under a tight deadline is gonna stop and give to charity, right? That's not the time for that. But I think it would be better to think of contribution as participation. 
uh, because really most of the time it's in your best interest. And so let's, let's look at a few examples of, of times that it can be in your best interest. Um, so suppose you're using a, a bit of Drupal software and you find something that's confusing, right? I think it's, you know, we've all been in that scenario where you spend six hours trying, you know, banging your head against the screen and, you know, when you finally come to, you realize that there was some checkbox that you didn't check and it was obscure and it was hard to find, but once you check that box, everything works as expected, right? And so what do you do? Well, ideally what you do is you go to the documentation for that project on Drupal.org and you document it and you, you document the thing that held you up for such a long time. And in doing that, you'll increase your karma. And another thing will happen, uh, you know, you might, and I suspect that many people have experienced this, you document something, you forget about it, and then a year later you have the same problem. You search for the problem you're having, and you find the documentation that you wrote. Raise your hand if that's ever happened to you, right? That is a shocking number of people in the room. I'm always amazed at how many people end up finding their own documentation, right? So that's, that's worth doing. You'll save yourself time, or at least you'll increase your karma. Another thing you, you can do when you encounter a bug is at least file a bug report. Maybe you're not in a position for whatever reason to fix the bug, but by filing a bug report, others can confirm that there's a bug. Um, and the maintainer, when they see that other people are having this bug, they know, oh, this is probably real. I should probably focus some attention on trying to fix that. It also makes it, increases the chances that someone else will come along and fix that. As an example of that idea, I had some bugs in the Drupal 6 version of COD that were preventing uh, a new release of the, of the project, and they were theme bugs. And I'm not really a themer, you know, I'm more of a back-end developer, so I, it wasn't efficient for me to spend time working on those. So I filed some bugs, I posted on groups.drupal.org, I said, hey, there are some release blockers. And then, all of a sudden, the next day, someone came along and had fixed all the bugs, right? It was amazing. And all I did was I took the time to screenshot. I took five minutes, made a screenshot of each bug, filed an issue for each bug, posted it to Drupal.org, and someone came along and fixed it. So another example of how if you just take five more minutes, you might really help yourself out in the end. Um, similarly, you know, if you are a developer or you have a developer on your team, you might find a bug, fix a patch, or file a patch, and post it to Drupal.org. And then once you do that, the patch is documented. It's, and ideally, it gets committed upstream to the Drupal.org project. And the benefit there to your client or to the project that you're working on is that that gets integrated into every site you build. Rather than having a custom version of that module, you know, a hacked, uh, locally modified version, the change you made gets pushed to Drupal.org, and it's in every version of that module, and you don't have to maintain it. And the alternative, of course, is that you maintain your own forked code, right? So think, you know, you should really take the time to file that patch and bill your client for it. I think a lot of people tend to think of time on Drupal.org as separate from client billable time uh, or project billable time. And in reality, when you're on Drupal.org, you're working in the best interest of the client or the project. So I, I encourage you to think of that as billable time for sure. Um, and the benefit of working upstream on Drupal.org in all these different ways is that participation happens in these little chunks, right? If I file documentation as I find the problem and file a patch as I find it, post a screenshot as I discover a bug, then I've posted already. I've, I've done the thing I need to do. And the alternative is to just wait until the end. Oh, we'll do it later, right? If you wait till the end, you've probably forgotten half the things that you need to post, and then you've got, this, you've got to carve out time somewhere, and that's probably definitely not billable time. And you've got to figure out when you're going to post all those things back to Drupal.org, right? So if you do it in a bite-sized way, it gets integrated into the project. You don't have this big list of things to do after you're done. Um, and you don't have this daunting post-project contribution phase that very often gets deprioritized and ends up not happening at all. Um, related to this idea of, of sort of working upstream being billable time, I think, so, so Linux is a kind of the quintessential example of open source open source operating system. A lot of people think of Linux as a bunch of people in basements writing software for free, and I can't speak to whether they're in basements or not, but I, I can refer to this study that looked at who was actually working on the Linux kernel, and it found that 75% of those so-called uh, volunteers are actually funded by the companies that they work for to do that work. And so, you know, perhaps their job description isn't necessarily like Linux core developer. Contributing back to the Linux core is an important part of their job. And so, you know, I think that when you look at some of the people who are the most prolific in Drupal, many of them do put in time that's separate um, 
outside of their jobs, and that's absolutely laudable. But many of them also put in a significant amount of time that is directly funded by their work. And I think that you know, going back to Greg's presentation yesterday and the idea of contrib and, and client time overlap, a great thing to do is to figure out how to get contrib and client time to overlap. It makes it much easier to contribute. So working upstream, right? You improve documentation, you increase the chances that bugs get fixed, you decrease maintenance burdens for your projects, and you increase your skills in karma, right? You get free feedback from the maintainer when they review a patch. That's like getting free training. You know, when else do you get free training? And it's not just small businesses that are embracing this philosophy, right? The White House has contributed their petitions distribution for Drupal back. Um, the New York Stock Exchange and The Economist are both organizations that have made contributions back to Drupal through their use of the project. And I, I like to use those particular organizations, the Stock Exchange and The Economist, because they're such clearly business-interested organizations. You know, they're not going to be working purely altruist altruistically. They're going to be working on their own business interest. Um, but I like to think about if they weren't, you know, The Economist is like, yeah, we're over it. We don't really care about money. We're just going to contribute. And then that on the right is the New York Chicken Stock Exchange. Um, if you're making contributions to Drupal, you can showcase them. Um, you can download this Drupal Give module from Drupal.org. And what that does is it allows your site, your company site, to provide a feed of contributions, small or large, that you make. And it gets ingested into Drupal.org. And there's a central listing where you can go and see a list of all of the Drupal Give things that people have submitted. So you can get a quick snapshot of sort of the stream of contributions that people are most excited in showcasing. And you can see what other people are doing that contribute, and you can build your own karma. Um, so I definitely recommend checking out uh, Drupal.org, Drupal Give. So if you don't have time to contribute, my response is, do you really have time not to contribute? It's really in your best interest and your project's best interest to do that. So to review, if you're not a developer, that's great. We need more of you. If you're afraid to look new, you shouldn't be, because we've all been there. If you think something is not polished enough, fish carcass. And if you don't have time to contribute, I think you probably don't have time to not contribute when you really examine uh, what it means to contribute, which I think would be better called participation. And that's it. Any questions? Thanks. Yep. Yeah, so the question was how did I make, you know, switch from Drupal being a hobby to it being a focus in my career. Um, so my, my sort of, I was um, a mix of, uh, you know, my, my work background at that point when I started using Drupal was mostly like various computer technician kind of roles. And I had a website, um, my personal website, and so I started using Drupal for that website. And then I decided, oh, it would be fun to get more professionally involved in Drupal and in web development. And so I got, you know, I, I got my foot in the door at a Drupal shop where I got some really great training, um, where I originally met Greg. And so it, you know, it was a mix of uh, sort of learning on my own. I bought some books about PHP and MySQL, and then getting some on-the-job training. Any other questions? Yep. I'd say, get out of here. I mean, it, it would depend on what the legal issue would be. Um, yeah, I mean, Drupal is licensed under the GPL2 plus license, and so it's very clearly expected and legal that people are contributing code back. Um, so if the, if the lawyers don't understand that, I think there's probably uh, some kind of miscommunication happening somewhere. I think that often people are, when people are hesitant to contribute, they feel like they're giving away some proprietary thing and they'll lose a competitive business advantage. And most of the time that's, you know, it depends on what you're building. But if you're, you know, unless you build uh, something, you know, an entire proprietary application that's very unique, that provides a unique kind of business value. And even then, like it's probably built out of components that are you know, it's, it's built out of common Drupal components like views and content types. And it, so ultimately, uh, your code is probably not that valuable, <laughs> frankly. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah, I should, I should probably disclaim that I'm not a lawyer, so I don't want to give out too much legal advice up here. Um, I would encourage you to post in the, there's a group on groups.drupal.org for universities, and I would encourage you to post there, um, not anonymously. <laughs> I would encourage you to post there, because I'm sure that someone else has been in a similar situation. Um, groups.drupal.org, and I, I, I forget what the group is called. It's, pro, it's like slash higher ed, I think. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, thanks everybody.